recording this too for other people weren't able to make today. Uh, what else? I think that's it. Okay, so I think that's all I have to tell you. And I'll just probably just keep admitting people as they join us on this. So I wanted to tell you that about Melanie. Melanie Sturgeon is president of the Arizona Women's <laughs> History Alliance. And of course, today's presentation is Arizona's Suffrage Journey. AWHA, which is Arizona Women's History Alliance, their primary goal is to increase public awareness of the experiences and contributions women have made to the development of Arizona and to the nation. And she is leading an effort to have a Frances Willard Munn suffrage statue placed on the Wesley Bolin Plaza. I believe that is outside of the, the Capitol building, you know, where all the statues are. Uh, Dr. Sturgeon did retire three years ago after 16 years as the state archivist and director of the Arizona State Archives and Records Management Branch of the Arizona State Library. And uh, she was uh, 12 years. She was um, until 2018. She was executive chair of the Arizona Women's Hall of Fame. She has an MA and PhD in history from UAS. She has always been passionate about the history of women. And she's currently writing a book about the business of prostitution in territorial Arizona. And that ought to be an interesting one. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, I'm, this is Melanie. Um, I'm going to, I went ahead and um, set it up so that she can start sharing her screen. And whenever you're ready, Melanie. All right, let me welcome. see if this works. There's you, yay. There's me. Yes, that's where I want to share. Okay, so now. Let's start with, oh, come on, slideshow, where are you? There we go. Can you all see that? Yes. yes. Okay, whoops. Oh, let me go back. <laughs> all right. So I really appreciate being able to talk to you about women's suffrage. And I have a tendency to keep talking faster and faster because I love history and I get very excited about it. So um, <laughs> give me a shout out if you think that I'm talking up way too fast here. So um, I do want to talk about the difference between suffragettes and suffragists. Uh, most of you probably know that, but I do have a lot of people that talk to me about the American suffragette movement and suffragettes were British. Um, the American hmm. women called themselves suffragists. And oh. so um, so if you're, if someone's talking to you about the suffragettes, you can ask them if they're talking about the English um, women's move to get the vote. So um, by the time I'm finished with this, I hope that you really have an appreciation for the complexity of the history of women's suffrage. In Arizona, nothing is ever as simple as it looks. Mm -hmm. And the importance of grassroots movements um, and the contributions of individual people to those movements. Sometimes people get discouraged about grassroots movements, but you will see through this presentation what a powerful um, Im impetus that can be. Also, learn about the importance of persistence when you're faced with seemingly insurmountable obstacles as the women were in Arizona. <clears throat> and I always like to remind us that there is a tie between past events and the present, things don't happen in isolation in, in our history. Also, as we're going through, to think about the benefits of cooperation and compromise when you're trying to work with diverse groups to get something that you love um, through. One of the things that I am gonna be talking about is the ways in which women obtaining the vote intercepted and collided with their rights and um, the rights, excuse me, sorry, and the provisions with, for other people, especially women of color and indigenous tribes in Arizona. So I want to just give a quick thank you to the Arizona State Archives, my former place of work. Um, they were so gracious in digitizing some incredible primary sources because being a historian, I always want to look at the original source to see if it's what it says it is. So here we go. So I wanted to provide some 
context for the national organization because Arizona does have intersections with the national, um, I'm gonna put that, whoops, sorry. Go back here. So I'm not gonna go back to Seneca Falls, but there are two organizations that were created in 1869 that were very important to the national movement and to some important to Arizona as well. In 1869, the group on the left, the National Women's Suffrage Association, organized. Their focus was getting a U.S. constitutional amendment to give suffrage to women no matter where they were. And they tried very hard, didn't have a lot of success with that. The women who started this organization are names that are probably very familiar to all of you. Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Lucretia Mott. The second group over on the right was the Arizona Women's Suffrage Association, and their focus was, I think, or we think it's important for the territories and the states to get women's suffrage on their, in their constitutions, because if we get enough states and territories with those in their constitution, Congress will have to act. And so that was their focus. And their founders were uh, Lucy Stone, Julia Ward Howe, Mary Livermore, and a male, Henry Ward Beecher were the founders of that group. And they worked um, a little bit at odds uh, sometimes when they were working together, but uh, they went their separate ways for quite a while. There's another group that was organized in 1874, was the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and they were all about um, getting prohibition, either in the US Constitution or in the various states, because at that time there, were, there was a great deal of alcoholism they were very concerned about disruptions to the home, poverty, and those sorts of things, and that was their focus. However, in 1876, Frances Willard became the president, and she decided, yes, that alcoholism is really important. We want to get rid of alcohol, but we also want to advocate for women's suffrage and other reforms. And because of this organization, this is the first way that Arizona gets involved in um, in suffrage. In 1890, those two groups, the National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association, joined together and their focus then became, let's get the states to pass um, legislation. And when we get enough of them, then we'll go to Congress and try to get an amendment. So that's just a basically bird's eye view of history. <laughs> African-American women's roles um, until recently have not been appreciated when we've been talking about um, women's suffrage and the fight for it. And they actually played a really important role in the passage of the 19th Amendment. Because of their unique positions, they tended to look when they wanted an amendment, they wanted um, human rights and universal suffrage rather than just focusing on women, they wanted universal suffrage because they have seen, of course, many things that had gone on in the South where men had the right to vote, well, not just the South in other parts, but were prohibited because of really extreme poll taxes, prejudice, and those kinds of things. And they wanted an amendment that would cover everyone. So some of their really important leaders that you've all heard of would be Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Mary Church Terrell, and Ida B. Wells were really prominent African-American women who were very involved in this. And even though they were excluded from attending the National American Women's Suffrage Association conventions and marches, they organized their own groups. Um, and that certainly is a result of prejudice that they weren't allowed to attend, but um, they organized their own groups and really got going. They um, attended political conventions at their local churches. They strategized everything that they could do to get the right to vote and support the other um, the white women that were trying to do this. Ida B. Wells actually founded the Alpha Suffrage Club in Chicago in 1913, and that was the very first black women's club that focused specifically on suffrage. This is um, a picture of their, of, this is their motto, lifting as we climb, again, indicating we want universal suffrage. Um, we want our people and anyone to have the rights that they, they deserve to have. Probably going backwards on this now. Once we get around the first decade or two of the 20th century, there's another group that starts to organize and it's called the National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage. And I'm going to be talking about them 
a little bit later. Um, the more we have states and territories voting to put suffrage in their constitutions, the harder this group works. This next image is just an image of suffrage by state. So you can get a really clear picture of when people got the vote. So anything in blue, those women in those states had full voting rights before the 19th Amendment was passed in 1920. So you can see that they're primarily Western states and some in the Midwest. Those in gray had full voting rights before the 19th Amendment and before they became states. So in other words, they were admitted when they were territories. In fact, 1869, the year that those two national suffrage organizations were formed, Wyoming uh, admitted as a territory and gave women the right to vote. They were actually the very first um, territory and state in the union that gave women that vote. Those in green, some states decided, well, you know, they're pushing for women's suffrage, so let's let them vote for president, but they can't vote for any legislators, and they can't vote for local people, but hey, okay, vote for president. And so those are the ones in green. And then the ones in yellow are the ones that gained their voting rights with this 19th Amendment. And you can see that it's primarily the southern states and really basically most of the, of the northeast um, states, even though that's where the fight for women's suffrage started. So the anti-suffrage groups were really good about um, making postcards that you could send off. They handed out things. And I just want to tell you what their arguments primarily for against women's suffrage were the following. Women are different than men and their place is in the home. And so if we give women the right to vote, we will expose them to, heaven forbid, corrupt politics. That was one of their, their main um, arguments. If we give women the vote, it will destroy homes and families. And you can see in the next few cards that that's, this is what they're trying to portray. Women don't really want the vote and only a few mostly radical women would use it. That was another argument. Women, this is the one I love, are not capable of understanding any of these issues. So why would we want to give them the vote? They're just, their little brains just can't wrap themselves around this information. Um, women will vote the way their husbands vote. So why would we go to all the trouble of getting an amendment if that's all that's gonna happen? So they really capitalized on the fact that there were a number of women who did, who did not want the vote. And so I want you to look at this first card. This is voting day. And you'll see the father with these two squalling babies. And I cannot tell you how many iterations of this postcard there are with the squalling babies. Kitchen tables mess, moms turning her back on everyone and walking out the door so that she can vote. A suffragette's home. Messy children are crying because mom's not there and there's poor bewildered dad can't take care of things. I love this one. I want to vote, but my wife won't let me. Um, everybody can vote but me and that again, the dad's taking over the household chores, baby and washing and all of that. They even had cards aimed at young people so that they would understand that if your job is to be at home and not be looking outward at these other issues. This is the one I really love. This is the development of a suffragette because the anti groups played on this one a lot. Starts out as a pretty girl, by age 40 she's not married, and by age 50 she's a suffragette and basically a harridan and we don't want anything to do with her because she's so radical and horrible. Um, they use this against um, a lot of the suffrage leaders over and over again. This is a household hints that they passed out. Um, on the other side are lots of household hints, but again, this is why they want women to vote no on women's suffrage. So they passed these out, they mailed them out, they did all sorts of things to get this into people's homes. Suffrage arguments on the other hand were, and the first one should sound very familiar to all of you, taxation without representation. In other words, we fought the Revolutionary War over that. I'm not gonna read every one of these, but one of the ones that really concerned them was the fact that laws affecting women are passed without consulting them. That women don't have a say in any of those. Um, they wanted to have a say because a lot of women were wage workers, even though they weren't recognized um, by a lot of the anti-suffrage people um, as having to work 
they wanted to have a say in their legislation, they thought they could really clean up government because they knew that it was um, corrupt. And they really felt that objections to women having the vote were based on prejudice and not on reason. So this is one of theirs. This is a cartoon they had, the anti-suffrage quartet. And you'll notice there are three men in this anti-suffrage quartet and one woman. And what they say is um, they're singing these familiar songs. Let's see. Protect the home, sweet woman's sphere is in the home. Keep your dear mother out of politics. Leave things as they be, let the woman mind the baby, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This next one I think is very powerful. It was, woman is bound and has no voice. Um, she cannot vote, she has no voice in the, in the political process. She, there are so many in, inequalities under the law. She doesn't have control of her finances, which in almost every state at that time was true. She has a lot of artificial limitations and she's bound because of prejudice and because of custom. This is an example of the Massachusetts uh, Women's Suffrage Association. They would pass out, <clears throat> excuse me, these handbills. And you probably can't read this, but under vote for women's suffrage, it says, give this to a friend and ask him to vote for it. Um, because of course, women could not vote. So they were trying to get this out to as many men as they possibly could. Arizona's first um, leap into women's suffrage occurred in 1883, and it was actually because of a bill that was introduced by um, a legislator from Yavapai County. And I have a little snippet here from a newspaper, um, the Arizona Sentinel, and it basically, they don't even mention his name. Respect for his family suppresses the name. There's a lot more discussion about how they didn't want to embarrass his wife and children. So it says, shall we paint the picture? Judas Iscariot, when he realized that he had sold his savior for 30 pieces of silver, went out and hanged himself. And what should the man do who has thus given himself dead away on so serious proposition? When I first read that, I was wondering if Judas Iscariot, has he um, sold his soul because he sold it to the women or because he sold his soul because he's he's voting or he's doing something that most men didn't want. But you can see there's another article down there a month later. Um, the bill was basically in the trash basket because it was completely, um, they, just, they just didn't do much with it in the legislature at all. So in Arizona, they organized the, the women organized the first Arizona um, Women's Christian Temperance Union chapter in 1884, the year after Mr. Um, Masterson introduced that bill. And in 1885, we had another legislator who, um, who introduced a bill. This one, I've just got little snippets here, but if you read the original article, it is very um, dismissive of women. It basically says that he was flirting with the women that were up in the balcony watching what was going on and, um, you know, that these women didn't really understand what was going on, et cetera, et cetera. It's interesting to note that at the rest of this newspaper, um, I just put a little snippet there. In spite of the fact that they're making fun of him, they do say, you know, maybe we'd better pay attention to this because this happened in Washington and the legislators there thought it was a joke and it ended up passing. So, um, so that's Arizona. So Arizona does not begin organizing the women don't until um, 1891. And this is Josephine Brawley Hughes. She was the president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union in 1890. She was a teacher and she co-owned the um, Arizona Daily Star newspaper in Tucson with her husband. And in 1890, she resigned as the president of the WCTU because remember they were now going for suffrage. And she used the newspapers as a forum to discuss the importance of suffrage to women in the state. So in 1891, one year later, she organized the first suffrage organization in our territory. And a lot of the members came from the Women's Christian Temperance Union. So we had women with these organizations foremost in their minds. She, Pauline O'Neill and her group, 
organized the first territorial suffrage convention where women actually came to Phoenix from the different branches and they all worked to strategize. Now, I wanna talk a little bit more about this 1899 um, bill because it, I've got some things that will kind of show you all the tension that's going on but behind the scenes that we don't normally see. Um, so George W. P. Hunt at that time was um, a senator and he was very pro suffrage. As early as 1897, he was giving speeches around the state about the importance of giving women the vote. And so I found these in his papers and I thought it was really interesting to kind of give you that sense of tension. So this is a suffrage telegram to him on February 19th, 1899, and you probably can't read it, but it says, as citizens and taxpayers of Globe and Gila County, believing that bill now before council granting suffrage to women of Arizona is inimical to the best interest of the territory, we request and urge you to oppose and vote against the women's suffrage bill. A day later, there's a letter, a pro-suffrage letter from William Herring, who is a very prominent attorney in Arizona. And he says, I beg to assure you that I have looked over the field carefully in relation to the point whether the suffrage bill can be passed without amendment as it came from the house and am satisfied that it can be done. I feel therefore it is in your power to confer a great boon upon the women of our territory by uniting with the friends of this measure and passing it as it is. I trust you will not be persuaded to the contrary. On February 24th, the editor of the Silver Belt newspaper sent him an anti-suffrage letter and said, the feeling is very strong here against women's suffrage. And as it is considered a question of importance and not a party measure, the feeling is that you should defer to the wishes of three-fourths or more of your constituency who are opposed to giving women the election franchise. I don't believe that many reputable women, and I say that word reputable women again, because again, there was a lot of smearing of women who were in favor of um, suffrage desire the privilege of voting or it would avail themselves of it if granted. I know it is concurred by a very large majority of the people of Globe. On February 27th, there was another pro-suffrage telegram to George Hunt and this one said, we learned only two days ago that a telegram misrepresenting the wishes of the people here had been forwarded to you remonstrating against the passage of the women's suffrage bill. We, the undersigned, have a petition signed by at least three-fourths of the taxpayers of this city, and we, which will be forwarded by mail. We urge you to use your judgment as we have implicit confidence in your honor and integrity. I love looking at those kinds of sources because it really gives you the voice of the people, at least the people that wrote to him and how they, and how they really felt about this. So again, it was filibustered and ended up going down to defeat. In 1901, they had another territorial convention, which means again, that women came from all over the state and spent a lot of time strategizing about how they were going to go forward. Um, at that convention, one of the members, Lida Robinson, decided that it would be important if they sent out a suffrage newsletter to all their members at least once a month to keep reminding them that this is an important issue and we, we don't want to forget this. And in 1903, Lido was actually elected the president um, and they held their third suffrage convention. It's hard to, um, you know, it's hard to realize how difficult it was for women to travel in those days. Roads were really bad. Um, it was difficult. A lot of them were coming in buckboard or there was a long train ride, but they did come and again, they did strategize. And 1903, they were able to persuade the legislature to enact um, an act, H HB House Bill number 81, and I'm going to read you what this says. Every woman above, above the age of 21 years residing in this territory and otherwise possessing the qualifications of an elector shall have the right to vote, and therefore there shall be no distinction between the sexes as to the qualifications of voters. 
there were a lot of legislators that said that they were going to support this. They felt the governor was going to support it. And you can imagine their shock when this is the official record from the House Journal. You can see it in red. The governor vetoed the bill on March 19th, 1903. Even though four other states had already included women's suffrage in the, their constitutions, he wrote them a very long, this is just page one of a very long uh, reason why he vetoed. He said, our enabling act does not allow us to do this. So therefore, that we'd be violating all these things and we'll get into trouble with Congress and basically, no. Um, you can imagine the anguish of the Arizona suffrage the suffrage women because they had been working so closely with all these legislators who had promised them they would do that. And there began to be rumors circulating that a lot of the legislators had just agreed to vote for it because they'd been meeting with the governor and they knew that he was going to um, veto it anyway. So it was no skin off their nose to vote for this. The women became so discouraged that they, they, just, they gave up. They just went home and thought, we've done everything. We can't think of anything else to do. We, we're just gonna stop worrying about this. So there's a hiatus of about six years. And then in 1909, Anna Howard Shaw, who was then um, head of the national organization, sent a field worker, she came to Arizona and she also sent another field worker named Laura Clay to come and work with Frances Munns to see if they could revive Arizona's efforts for women's suffrage, because by that time, a lot more Western states had been looking at suffrage and had given women the vote. And the national organization was thinking, it's the West, we've got to get these votes passed in the West. They're, they're the ones that are going to start to tip what's going on. So in 1909, Frances Willard Munns became the president of the new Arizona Equal Suffrage Association. She was an amazing woman. She was a consummate strategist and um, she, I mean, under her leadership, she formed coalitions all over the state that became very powerful. She worked with miners, labor leaders, farmers, ranchers, and yes, even Mormons, Democrats and Republicans. She didn't care which party you belong to. She just tried to get people who were in favor of this. At that time, the um, women's suffrage groups met with prominent Mexican-American business and political leaders. Um, they did not reach out so much to the average worker because their actions reflected a common Western prejudice at that time um, against the average Mexican worker because they believed that they were illiterate, even though many of them could read um, Spanish and didn't understand the issues around suffrage and that they would vote against it. And in 1909, unfortunately, Laura Clay, the national field worker, had just come from several Southern states, I think it was Kansas, where she had successfully um, gotten legislation on their ballot that said that white women could vote, but African-American women were excluded. And she was, she was very prejudiced and she got, she persuaded Munns and another, a number of other groups to support legislation that required um, English literacy test in order to vote. And it was a hard literacy test. You had to be able to read large portions of the Arizona constitution to the satisfaction of whomever was um, registering you to vote to allow you to do so. I just wanted to give you a sense of Arizona's population distribution in 1910. We didn't really have very many people, 204,354. There's a lot of speculation as to why, um, why did the Arizona suffragist people not reach out to African-Americans? Well, you can see here, that there were only 2009 African-Americans making up 1% of Arizona's residents. The majority of them were male. There were less that there were fewer than 200 females and most of those were children. I think they just looked at them and thought it's, you know, it's not worth putting our effort there because there are so few of them. A few Chinese, a smaller number of Japanese, but you'll see that the largest group outside of native-born Americans, whites, were the Mexicans. 
29,402 of those were born outside the US, which did not mean that they weren't citizens. It just mean they weren't born here. And they made up 25% of the population, a, an enormous um, boon for the suffrage group had they really gone after them. So during this time, between 1910 and 1909 and 1909, another field worker came to Arizona and she was very passionate about women's suffrage and trying to get everyone to work. She went everywhere through the state on buckboards into really remote areas. The roads weren't terribly good, but she really was trying to get support for the Arizona women's suffrage. And in 1910, we had our constitutional convention. Uh, Arizona had been trying to become a state for years and years and years, and this time it looked like they would finally make it. And so if you know anything about the history of our Constitution, the President of the United States and Congress rejected our original Constitution because it had the initiative and referendum and the recall of judges in there. So they said, well, we'll consider having you become a state if you take that out of your Constitution. But Munns was looking at this 1910 thinking, this is a perfect time for us to couple women's suffrage with the Constitution. Let's get women's suffrage in there. So they went to the Constitutional Convention, a number of women, very intelligent, articulate women, and presented their case. The delegates rejected their suffrage plank 30 to 19. A number of them rejected it because, again, there was that idea that you know women shouldn't be involved in politics. But there was another group that really felt like, look, if we're getting rumors already about the initiative and referendum and the recall of judges, if we put women's suffrage in there, that's just like the stamp of, nope, you can't be a state. So even though George W. P. Hunt had supported Frances Munns so far, he turned her down and she did not forgive him for that. She was very, very angry. Of course, once we became a state in 1912, one of the first did was to put the initiative and referendum and the recall of judges back into our constitution. The federal government had no control over that by that time. And so one of the legislators introduced a new uh, a referendum to give women the right to vote. And it was defeated by one vote and couldn't go any farther. Unfortunately, in 1912, the new legislature also um, put in another bill about literacy test, which eliminated a lot of Native American voters and some voters that had come to the United States from Europe who didn't speak English as well as native born. So Frances Munns looked at that and she decided, I'm going to I'm not gonna to talk to the legislature anymore. It's perfectly clear that they're always gonna defeat this. We now have that initiative and referendum in our constitution. We're gonna go out and we're gonna to talk to male voters and we are going to persuade them to vote for this. So, um, so if any of you have family that's been in Arizona for a number of generations, you might wanna take a trip down to the state archives because they have the original petitions that were signed um, by men. And I want you to think about this. This is in the heat of summer. They didn't have very much time to do this. In July and August, when it's incredibly hot, these are women with wearing corsets, long skirts, long shirts. It was hot. And yet they felt so passionately about this that they were willing to do that and do things that were considered they, in quotations, unladylike, like standing out, going to meetings, standing out in the street and trying to get people to sign petitions. And they were, um, they were successful. Munns was recognized by even newspapers that were against suffrage as being a very gracious and energetic woman. And she would not be drawn into an argument based on emotion. She just said, if we wanna talk about women's suffrage, we can have an intellectual discussion and not one based on emotions. Again, she created those incredibly strong coalitions around the state. And one of the biggest groups in opposition to Arizona's suffrage um, were the saloon men. 
and I'm just going to check my time because sometimes I just go on and on. Sorry, just want to make sure that I. So the saloon men were against um, women's suffrage because they knew that so many of the women's Christian temperance union women belonged to this. As a historian who looks at um, censuses and who looks at um, businesses in communities, it would blow your mind if you knew how many saloons were in, in communities. I mean, little tiny communities could have as many as 34 or 40 saloons. This was a huge source of revenue. And so the saloon men did everything they could to make sure that women weren't going to get the vote because they knew that they would probably pass a prohibition bill. But again, Munns galvanized all of these people. She even had men collecting petitions, um, signatures for them. She was incredibly successful. This is the handout, one of the original handouts that they gave to men who were um, going to vote on election day. And I just wanted to go over some of the things that they had at the bottom, some of their arguments. Some of them are familiar because they're from the national sort of um, what the national group was doing, but some of them are unique to Arizona. Those who obey the law should have a say in their making. Those who pay taxes to government should be represented in the government. Those who have charge of the home and the children must be able to protect them. And remember this, Arizona women struggle as men to build the state. It was amazing the turnout they had she and the women who were working for suffrage were able to persuade close to 68% of the male electorates to vote for women's suffrage. At that time, that was the highest percentage of voters in any of the states and territories that had voted to give women the vote. They were, they were wildly successful. Unfortunately, not everyone got the vote. Um, in Arizona, African-American women were allowed to vote. Mexican-American women were allowed to vote, assuming they could read and do all the other things that they did. But there was one group that was completely left out, and those were Native Americans, because um, in Arizona, they did not get the vote until 1948. And I'll talk a little bit later about why that occurred. Unfortunately, um, as in many other states, once women got the vote, Arizona began to, um, to institute things like poll taxes, which meant that you had to pay to vote. So it really discriminated against the poor and also many people of color. Nevertheless, um, Arizona women voted, uh, registered to vote in droves. So I just wanna give you kind of a little rundown um, about what Arizona women did after they got the vote. Um, they did not sit on their behinds and just say, this is great, we got, we got this vote going. By the way, I just wanted to tell you something about Frances Mund. She was five foot two with red hair. Um, it's very incredibly vivacious a little woman um, who did all this. So in January of 1913, since in November, on November 5th, they had given them a vote. The state legislature passed an emergency bill saying, oh, we'd better let women register to vote, which they did. And in 1913, even though the first elections that women could vote in were in 1914, because the legislature at that time met every two years, not every year like they do now. But in 1913, the Arizona Federation of Women's Clubs lobbied the legislature to pass legislation for an eight hour work week for women, for mothers' pensions when husbands had died, and for raising the age of sexual consent from fem for females from age 14 to age 16 and for males to age 18. That doesn't sound like a particularly stunning thing, but a lot of women were very concerned because, um, because initially when Arizona was first started, the age of consent for sexual intercourse for girls was age 12, and over time, it was moved to age 14 and they were very excited to have it moved to age 16 because they felt that there were so many young women that were being taken advantage of. As I said, women voted. And if you ever want a fun afternoon, go down to the state archives and look at their voter registrations because when women started voting, they actually weighed them and, and described them. And one woman that was researching her grandmother came in and said to me, I watched my grandmother grow like two inches um, and, you know, 
or my great grandmother. I didn't really know what color her hair was to picture her in color, but they described her. So that was kind of fun. Women came out and voted in that first election. They were they were very cognizant of the fact that we fought hard to get this. We better show up at the voting polls and let people know that this is important to us. In 1914, Frances Munns was elected the first female legislator in Arizona's Senate. And Rachel Berry, who was another suffragette from, or suffragette, suffragist, excuse me, from Apache County, she, um, she was elected the first female representative. They worked everywhere, not these two women, but the Arizona Women's Clubs worked behind the scenes. They did all sorts of things. The Arizona Women's Christian Temperance Union had all kinds of meetings and uh, to go out and get women to register to vote to help them. They also got sufficient signatures on the ballot to get a prohibition initiative. Just as the saloon men had feared, it won with 53% of the vote. And for those of you that know, don't know, Arizona became a dry state in 1915 um, and the saloons had to shut down. In August of 1915, the African-American women in Phoenix organized the, the first Arizona Federation of Co Colored Women's Clubs, and they spent a lot of time educating voters on issues and opportunities um, to fight racism and improve economic and educational opportunities for uh, women in their communities. The Colored Women's Club also went for the Phoenix City um, what is it called, council, to protest the showing of the movie Birth of a Nation, which, which really denigrated um, African Americans and, and spoke quite forcefully. Uh, they, it didn't have much effect on the city council, but I felt that they were, they were pretty brave to do that. Rosa Lyons McKay was elected to the legislature from Cochise County, and she got asked the first minimum wage bill for women. When she first went into the legislature, the average salary for a woman that was working at a job was $3 an hour as compared to approximately 16 for men. She just, there was just this idea that, well, we know that women work, but you know, they probably have husbands that will help them. This is just for pocket money. And she was very familiar with a lot of women that were barely making it. So she was able in three sessions of the legislature to get that minimum wage from three dollars to sixteen dollars a week which is an amazing accomplishment and she she did this much of this just on her own in 1920 four female legislators introduced arizona's ratification of the 19th amendment and it passed both houses with um with no um, votes against it. And in fact, the governor sent out um, a meeting for this legislature to meet. He basically said, we have seen in the um, eight years that Arizona women have had the vote, the incredible work that they have done, the fact that they are very thoughtful and careful, et cetera, et cetera, which was amazing, the change in just eight years um, toward that. In 1922, the women's clubs and, and um, and all sorts of other women's organizations really pressed the legislature to vote for the Shepherd Towner Act, which was a federal act giving, giving funds to states to help um, mothers during their pregnancies and afterwards. It was a, called an act for mothers and well babies. Now, again, Native Americans still did not have the vote. And it wasn't until 1948 that two World War II veterans from the Yavapai tribe at Fort McDowell sued Maricopa County Recorder's Office for not allowing them to register to vote. And Judge Levi S. Udall, who ruled in favor of their right to vote, said this, to deny the right to vote when one is legally entitled to do so is to do violence to the principles of freedom and equality. Arizona can proudly say that they have had more women in our legislature than any other state um, and more women in elected office than than the other states. Um, they have continued to be active politically and um, and continued um, grassroots movements for a number of things. 
So on August 27th, Tennessee was the 36th state to ratify the 19th Amendment. This was not an easy process. Um, there's a book called The Woman's Hour, if you haven't read it. It talks about all of the dreadful things that went on behind the scenes um, in the legislature in Tennessee. That bill barely passed. There were people coming from all parts of the country, huge amounts of bribery and all sorts of other things going on. But anyway, at long last, they, they got the right to vote. So did that mean that there was universal suffrage? All women could vote? Well, the answer is no. Um, this picture, by the way, is California. Uh, the one on the right, California women. I could not find a photograph anywhere of Arizona women voting in their first election, but I thought this was pretty exciting. So there are federal laws that prohibit citizenships to some groups, and you have to be a citizen to vote. So if you're an excluded group under federal statute, you cannot become a citizen, and therefore you can't vote. This started in the United States in 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act. Act. Um, America did not like the fact that so many Chinese were coming in. They, they did not recognize them as citizens, and as time went on, even people that were third generation Chinese born in this country could still not vote because they were not recognized as citizens. The Indian Citizenship Act of 1924, the federal government uh, passed this bill that basically said that they are now citizens and they made so many loopholes in the bill that a lot of states could sort of escape giving them the vote and Arizona was one of those. We were the the second last state in the union to give Arizona Indians, Native Americans, the right to vote, and that was in 1948. In 1943, the federal government passed the Magnuson Act, which finally gave the Chinese the right to vote. In 1946, the Loose Seller Act, which gave Filipinos and residents from India the right to vote. And finally, in 1952, they passed the Immigration Act, giving Japanese and other Asian Americans the right to vote. This doesn't, of course, change anything about what the women who fought so hard to get the vote for women. It doesn't change our understanding of their efforts, but it is a little sobering sometimes, I think, to realize that there were still a number of people who had lived here for multiple generations who could not vote until the federal government passed those laws. Sylvia mentioned that I'm the president of the um, Arizona Women's History Alliance, and we had a juried selection for sculptors to create a statue and this happens to be the statue of the woman uh, the female artist from Arizona. She wanted to show Frances Munns walking forward so she said that flag is representing all the women behind her that worked so hard. Frances Munns is moving forward she's not standing still and in her hand when this is completed that handbill that you all saw will be there and that is the election box, um, an election box from 1912. So I just wanted to show you how far that the sculptor is going. We are so looking forward to getting this on the Wesley Bowen Plaza and we were so excited because we have to work with the Department of Administration and the person we're working with is a male and he was so excited to be working on this that they have given Frances Munns the premier position on Wesley Bowen Plaza, she's actually facing the legislature, which I thought was so appropriate um, with this handbill in her hand. So I thank you all for my rapid um, discussion. Is there, are there any, any questions? There was one in the chat box. Okay, let me get out of my slideshow so I can actually see it. That was great, by the way. Let's see, let's get back to this. Hopefully this will come up. Oops, let me stop sharing. That's why it will let me come up. There we go. All right, chat. Oh, I'm sorry that I cut out. Ida B. Wells started the Alpha, um, the Alpha Club in Chicago, which was the first African-American suffrage club in the country. So when women were finally able to vote, they had a, a wonderful turn a, tur turnout. All right, if you're talking about Arizona, actually, Arizona had a wonderful turnout because the women here were so concerned that we've worked, as I said, we've worked so hard um, to do this. I don't 
think that I could tell you what the percentage is, but I do know from looking at the voter registrations that a number of women um, voted, African-American women, um, Mexican-American women voted, um, and so did Mexican? Small counties, the vote was, it was good, so. Oh. Congratulations to them for doing all that. Um, can we donate to the statue? Yes, you can. Um, you can go to our website, which is the Arizona Women's History Alliance. There is a section for donating and you can donate there. You can either write a check or you can, um, you can use PayPal. So um, we've raised about $48,000 so far and we're waiting for this pandemic. We had a couple of really good fundraisers set up, but because of the pandemic, of course, we have to cancel them. So we're we're moving forward. Um, we're very pleased with the with the work of the sculptor. She's very excited about what she's doing. So that's a good thing. Any other questions? Oh, when they voted in the U.S. Um, the U.S. turnout, I don't know that I've ever seen statistics on the numbers of women that turned out because they, as you know, when you vote, it doesn't, when they start compiling things, it doesn't tell you this was a male or this was a female. But um, I know in Southern states, it was a lot lower than it was in other parts of the country. The West tended to have much higher rates of women voting initially than in other parts of the country. And I think it's, it's because, partly because, I, I know this sounds like a cliche, but in the West, we have a, a more independent sort of spirit. Of, and people, I mean, I think women had to make their way here in ways that they didn't have to, uh, in most Western states, in ways that they didn't have to when they were in more settled areas. So um, this is really great. We've always been activists, yes. Oh, and I just wanted to um, just wanted to remind you again um, that when you see what those women did, you really can see how grassroots movements have a lot of power, um, and that it does take persistence. It sometimes gets very discouraging when you think you've worked so hard and and nothing has happened, but. Um, and every movement has ups and downs and it has detours and bricks walls and every movement makes mistakes. Um, we, we have to look at our own history in this country of the women's suffrage movement to know that there were women who were excluded from participating in this. Um, Frances Mund, I can tell you from all the things I've read that she said, she would never agree with anyone who said, my vote does not count. So part of what I, I hope um, that that we will all do is um, celebrate the strength of these early women and really continue their legacy. And as an archivist, and especially as a historian, I always urge women, please turn in your papers to archives. Because when you look at the archives, I mean, there are some archives, women's archives that are really wonderful. But when you look at the archival collections, even in Arizona, the percentage of women's papers are so small and women have done so much that I urge you, if you've had a really interesting career or you've done, you've been a really an activist that you think about the groups you belong to and turn your papers over to an archives so the rest of us can see them. We need, how much money is needed for the statue? Um, we need about 200 and $70,000 to pay for everything for the statue. So we're, we, we're still got a long way to go, but we're very excited <laughs> at where we've been so far. So thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions from anyone? These are all great questions. Well, Dr. Sturgeon, we just really appreciate your presentation. It's very interesting to hear about the history. And, you know, we, it's so easy to take what we have for granted. Yes. And, and now we know <laughs> how much effort and work, besides the national women's suffrage movement, but here in Arizona and um, 
so much. It makes us, it should make us more appreciative of what we have, you know. Yes. It was 100 years ago or more, in 1912 for here in Arizona, but um, so that has been really a great overview and I've really enjoyed it. I think all of us have enjoyed it. And uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, you know to take the time to do this for us. And it would be great for us to, to keep in touch with how that statue is going. <laughs> I will keep you updated. <laughs> thank you. In one of our Explore Arizona, we went over to the Capitol building and did a tour. But mm -hmm. we, as part of that, we went to that, um, what was it called, Bro Brolin? Wesley Bolin Plaza, yes. Wesley Bolin Plaza. Okay, we went there. We were looking at all the different statues. And uh, I thought, wow, this is, I had, I had no idea that was there. So yes. yeah, it would be nice to know when it's done. And so we could maybe include that in another tour that we yes. do. Yes, and this is the first individual woman that will be on that plaza. The others are just representations of women. But this will be Frances Willard Munns and... Um, and we hope that especially, especially young people, when they go and look at this, that they, that they recognize how important it is that mm -hmm. individuals, I mean, the, the differences that individuals can make, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's great. Right, and then like you said in your presentation, it can be pretty discouraging when you try and try and try and nothing happens, but eventually, if enough people do yes <laughs> and they keep doing it it something will happen yes it will and i want to thank you all for inviting me to come i i love to talk about women's history and especially this time about the, the women that got the vote for us here so i'm just going to say one thing in, in closing a number of years ago i was invited to um one of my neighbors was a legislator and she invited me to a group of women and this was like the third time I'd gone. And they said to her at this meeting, could you please tell us who we should vote for? Uh, because you know so much. And I rose out of my chair <laughs> and said, did any of you have great grandmothers or grandmothers that worked for women's suffrage? And a couple have put their hands up. And I said, they would roll over in their graves to hear you say that because they were so adamant that women needed to be to understand issues and be educated so that's my anyway thank you well you know maybe one of these days when you get your like uh, your book down on um <laughs> prostitution oh, yeah. in arizona maybe that will be another interesting topic for another time um you're still working on the book i take it right i am and i got started on that book because I don't know if you ever noticed books in the airport, but they always have at least one on prostitutes and they're always very um, salacious and they don't treat these women as individuals. And so mine really is the business of prostitution. It's yes. How did, how were they set up? You know, that sort of thing. And, um, and that their lives were very difficult. They weren't the way they're portrayed in so many of those books because I just have read thousands of court cases and I thought people need to understand this a little better. So that's why. That's great because I know I've been to Tombstone and I've been to um, uh, Jerome and in both places they had little history places that you could go in and then they talked about the prostitutes in the town. Yes. But they didn't really talk about their lives too much at all. Yeah. What they, they had don't. to put up with. <laughs> That's so right. That, you know, so in the future, we'll stay in touch. And so in, someday we'll, we'll hear all about, about that. Thank you. Somebody did ask the question, facts about candidates. I think that the League of Women Voters is always a good source mm. for facts about candidates because they do try to be... Um, try to be as neutral as possible and give you as much um, information as possible. So I, I would say that is a really excellent source. So. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Melanie. This was very informative and uh, I appreciate your time. And I think we all have a better understanding now. <laughs> 
uh, on an appreciation of our right to vote here in Arizona. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're Thank very you. welcome. Thank you all. All right. Take care, everyone. We'll see you next month. Bye. Bye.